Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Jasmine Samurai Interviews. I thought the first interview should feature an OG, and you don't get much more OG than Little Bib Man. Little Bib Man is probably the most influential Jasmine community member because he inspired so many others to research Jasmine. I remember reading his post on Reddit back in 2021 while I was on, on a container ship going between the east coast of the United States and northern Europe. I was fascinated with what he was uncovering, and much of his early research has materialized into partnerships and announced developments. After reading Little Bed Man's research for a couple months, I knew Jasmine was different from anything else out there, which led to my dedication to learning blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. People from all over the world have read his work, and now you're finally going to hear from the man himself. It is an honor to have you a little bit, man. How are you? Hey, what's up? How you doing? What's up, Icy? Doing well, doing well. So, What is up, community? Hello. I'm a pretty normal person behind everything, and uh, but I am probably as fascinated with Jasmine as any of you. And I'm continuing to be so. So hello, everybody. And I hope we have a cool conversation uh, today, you know. This is my own, my third Twitter space, too, I'd like to say. So I'm new to this whole um, talking head role. That, in the that's community. just fine. It, <laughs> so, it sounds like you're in Oakland right now. I can hear the sirens. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a beautiful day in Oakland, though. <laughs> well, let's just hop right into it. So the first question I have for you is, who is Little Bib Man? What do you do professionally? And what are your hobbies? Gotcha. Okay. So, um, let's see. By trade, I'm just an electrical engineer. Your standard run-of-the-mill run wire and make sure electricity gets from point A to point B. Um, that's what I was trained for in college. And I went to school to steel uh, the steel mill in Pittsburgh, California. We have a Pittsburgh, California, too is actually where the steel mill is and we would take classes there and uh, from there I just got a interest in how electricity ran from one place to the next how it got from here to there and you know even now like wireless transmission of electricity is extra extra fascinating because that goes back to Tesla the original Tesla um, but while in college doing electrical engineering some of us were brought over to the music department in the school to help build and bring in new equipment and fix the studios and even fix some of the, you know, the gear in there, you know, learning how to wire microphones and create coils to create, you know, magnetic induction and, you know, just a lot of interesting things. Having grown up where I grew up, there's a lot of creative people. A lot of my friends were into music. And, uh, and so I would, you know, bring them into school, get them into the studio. And I developed a passion for transmitting electricity um, in audio form, you know, not just to power a house, but also to power our soul and creative, you know, um, parts of our, our personalities, you know. So that is... The gist of it over the years, I've done everything from live sound um, in cold weather and hot weather and sound travels differently in different temperatures. And once again, we're dealing with, you know, electricity. It's still all electricity. And uh, and then computers, you know, I, I'm in the half a century club. So I'm in my, the middle of my life and I've seen a lot of technology change and, you know, computers has come into you know play during my life we didn't grow up with computers in our houses and once again that's still electrical every time you hit click a keyboard you click one letter you're sending electricity and now we're looking at electricity as like almost data which is where like bitcoin comes in so it's still all electricity so like my whole life has been based around electricity getting from one place to the next and now we're we're doing it with money too money is in the form of electricity being passed around so my original field is still pretty much what I'm into, but it's just grown so much and encompasses so much that there's, you know, a million possibilities 
for, you know, what I can do and who I can work for and how I can help out different projects and different teams and what they're trying to resolve, whether it's, um, you know, getting the best audio quality that you can get today. I'm fascinated with the NFTs. I always thought MP3s ripped off the artists. You know, I thought that was the worst thing that happened to music was free MP3s. And I love free stuff. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, that's also what interests me about things like Jasmine, the, using blockchain for digital, uh, you know, rights management for content creators. Uh, and once again, content is electricity, whether it's, you know, Photoshop or, you know, video a meme, all of those are still created with electricity. And once you create it, you're trying to get that electrical digital representation from point A to point B. So at a certain point, I think I realized that this does compromise everybody's personal data in ways that I didn't see in the beginning. Because in the very beginning, most of the equipment I was working on wasn't connected to the internet. It was digital. It was electrical equipment, but it didn't have access to get hacked. Like you couldn't hack a speaker <laughs> or a mixing board or, or any of that. And so uh, it wasn't until later on that you start to realize how much information we are sharing. Once computers came around, I had to put my information in to listen to an album, to listen to new music. I had to give up information that was completely unnecessary for me to be able to listen to music. And um, it's basically the gist of it. Some of the jobs I've had, I've built speakers. I've taught high school. Um, I've worked in uh, studios. I've worked at Fantasy Studios in Berkeley for a while. That's where they recorded the Carlos Santana Supernatural album. And tons of tons and tons of albums came. Creedence Clearwater Revival came out of there before my time. And I was... At one point, I was even uh, manufacturing vinyl and cutting the masters and, 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 and doing that job. So I've, in, in my 50 years, I've done a, a lot of roles, but they've all been based on electrical engineering principles. So I find that, that is, fascinating. I mean, as another as a marine engineer, you know, I'm kind of like a combination between electrical and mechanical lean a little bit more towards mechanical electrical is hard. You know, that's always like electrical is a common weak point for engineers at sea so i have a lot of respect for that it kind of reminds me of that one pro i can't remember but that one smart little town that they were making in japan where they were sending communication through the power yeah i mean i lost my mind when i started reading about uh the electrical uh the the grid the grids they were building there and that you could actually if one company if one household wasn't home all day and they were using electricity and another household was overusing electricity it could borrow electricity from that house like that's crazy and then they were yeah. talking about all the roads were going to be transporting electricity right through the road into the smart vehicles that everyone will be using to you know drive around and we saw you know may i think there was two videos with jasmine involved that showed those cars i don't think they were getting the wireless power out of the ground yet but i saw the i the concept of less people owning their own cars in japan and using the public transportation and how they're building these public transportation things to be more accommodating by not forcing everyone onto a bus even you know because they realize they don't need buses not everyone's going to exactly the same place and they have a problem in those uh, in a lot of the prefectures in Japan where they don't have enough people to have Uber and Lyft drivers. You know, it's just not what's up there. So they're doing the robo taxi mode with wireless power integration, which is, I I still there's some things that I even know how to do in electric, you know, with electricity that I don't actually understand how they work. It's like gravity, like I get gravity, but I still, you know, it's still hard to. Nobody fully understands why or how. Yeah, gravity gets me more than I get gravity. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> gravity got all of us. <laughs> <laughs> 
just a quick reminder to everybody listening uh, to please retweet the space so we can get more listeners in. And if you have a question for Little Bitman, feel free to uh, drop a comment under this space. Uh, we'll review it. I can't promise that you know he's going to answer anything, but you know we we'll, we can take a look. If it's so, reasonable, um, we'll answer it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know someone on Reddit didn't someone. I think someone asked what your favorite dinosaur was. My favorite dinosaur. Wow. I mean, whew, my favorite dinosaur is probably the Komodo dragon. Yes, yeah, it's still around. Those things are mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm going I'm to go with Komodo. In fact, it even goes with, with uh, J- Japan to some extent. So, yeah, Komodo dragon is my favorite dinosaur. It's still trudging along. Uh, one of the few dinosaurs that made it. That and uh, me and Jesse, we got we got we got the gators down in Florida, so we got we got those covered. Oh, gators are amazing! I don't know how they fared so well for so long. Is it not tasty meat? I've never had a gator burger. I don't. Uh, gator gator tail is is the common. Uh, it's it's you know bacon wrapped gator tail is 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 tasty. I've watched that History Channel show where the, the swamp people show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I can completely live through there. Um, through their experiences. I don't need to experience that myself. That's crazy. You Florida people are crazy. We are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So the second serious question for you I have is, how did you discover jazz music? Coinbase, new token listing, the day that it came out. And FOMO. Nice. And a little bit of FOMO. I remember, um, I just remember opening it up and being like, Jasmine, that just sounds awful. You know, it doesn't sound like Cardano and all these like fancy, you know, flashy names. (laughs) Like, what's Jasmine? You know, I just checked it out anyway. And I read Sony and Sony execs. And I was like, what? This makes no sense, you know? a blockchain built by people from Sony, you know, and I was aware at the time that they were ex Sony, but it was still like, it wasn't just some random person that was nobody at Sony saying, yeah, I used to work at Sony. I'm starting a blockchain. It was like literally the ex president, several of the engineers that worked on, you know, pretty critical projects and, and technology that we actually all use. That's already integrated into our devices like Felica and, uh, you know, and Bluetooth, you know, that's in everybody's phone too. And then I think it was, uh, the marketing, you know, angle of Kazuma Sasato, you know, reading that he brought the, helped introduce the iPhone to, uh, Japan. I thought that was a kind of a big deal for me. My ears, you know, my eyes lit up. So then I bought like a couple hundred bucks of jazz movie right on the spot. I phoned in. I said, bam, buying some. And then I read the white paper. And the white paper blew my mind. And I searched the internet for jazz me. I found there was a Reddit community. I think I spent about three or four days looking at Reddit as an outsider. I didn't have an account, so I couldn't participate or anything and then within four days i decided to join reddit just so i could have easy access to the uh the jasmine channel and i think there was i think there was a little less than a thousand people at the time i think there was like when i first went to reddit there was maybe 600 people and by the time i joined there was like 750 or eight And then I remember there was the first thousand and there was like that image they made for the first thousand samurais. And then finally they made the one for the 5,000. And I think there was even one for 10,000. I'm not fully sure about the 10,000 one, but I think so. Yeah, we still have the first 10K uh, flare. I don't even know how many people from the first 1,000 are still around. And you guys don't have metrics? I mean, can you see that or how does that work? There's metrics, but I don't uh, like detailed user information like that. I don't, yeah, I'll have to dig around. 
But um, well, you you pretty much answered the next question, which was what compelled you to research and post about Jasmine over other crypto projects. Unless if you had anything else well, to add to I, that. I mean, I guess to some extent, um, it was because there wasn't that much info on it. So I was felt like I was uncovering info that hadn't been shared on Reddit, and there wasn't any other community around Jasmine yet where people were posting about Jasmine much. I mean, there was a few posts on GitHub that I even had horror in on them, but they were pre Coinbase listing. They were pre the regulations in Japan and the banning of crypto in, in China. So those were anything you read there, you had to take into account that whatever they were discussing and, and trying to do was pre regulation and pre India and uh, China banning crypto. So, you know, so I looked at the Reddit one and I was in every day, the same questions were being asked, you know, it's like nobody can answer certain basic questions. And so I finally had the nerve to post something on, on Reddit. Cause I'd heard horror stories about joining Reddit and posting anything and you're going to get attacked and it's the worst thing ever. And you have to keep, you know, you'll post something, you have to spend your whole day coming back to it and I, you know this is what people had told me about it and i was like i was like i'm not really having that uh i'm not actually having that experience there you know pretty much posting stuff we're having healthy conversations you know and uh there's room for people to ask questions i think there was a certain point where the fud was like kind of over the top you know and i think that's when i started doing more deep dives for everyone kind of trying to organize my thoughts around it and make it intelligible because some of the FUD was just pure lies. You know, I'm not saying that there wasn't any reason to FUD. There was so much unknown about Jasmine that it was easy for even me to wonder what the hell was going on. But the dark days. When, when people would post something like they don't have a partnership with so-and-so and it's like, no, there's actually a legitimate article in Reuters that says that they do or legitimate, you know, Forbes has them listed as a legitimate company and they have legitimate partnerships. So it was easy at a certain point to look at the FUD and be like, well, this person either doesn't know what they're talking about or they're lying. And I could kind of start there with my involvement in, in the Reddit community with just trying to straighten the facts from the FUD. It was a lot of work, but we did, uh, I think, yeah, the Reddit is, is a great place, you know, and I, I, sometimes I drop into these other Reddit communities, crypto communities, they're all horrible. They don't allow, they, they just accuse everything as a advertisement or a shill. And there's really no real discussions in any of those other communities. And Jasmine is still in the top 50 crypto communities on Reddit, which I hope we reach the top 25, but we would need many more thousands to join because unfortunately they just go off of a subscriber number and not actual activity but right so in the beginning with reddit it, i definitely felt like there was a lot more focus on what jasmine was and as jasmine kind of became what we knew it was and people start, started buying more i think people's investments became you know more volatile basically you know if you have ten dollars and something that drops 40 percent, you know like whatever i got six bucks it doesn't feel like anything but if you have a thousand it it hurts a little hard you know a lot harder and all of a sudden the price of Jasmine became more valuable of a discussion, you know, than actually what Jasmine is like. To it the point still where is. Look, look, yeah. look at the most popular posts on this platform, all the most popular posts and the profiles that have the most subscribers and followers. They, they just mostly talk about price. And so there's two stories going on. I had to learn to separate the two stories, even in my own head. There's one, there's a company that's trying to do amazing things, has some patents, you know, has some great partnerships. They have a few products and they look very, very promising. And then there's the story of the token, which is like, has absolutely nothing to do with the daily operation of Jasmine. You know, it has, it, but it still reflects on Jasmine, right? It still has like, you can't completely separate it and say the, the coin means nothing. So I think at that point, there was a, a, a really healthy split in the community between people who started doing intensive TA for um, 
people who are interested in that. And I think it's super, super valuable for anybody just coming into Jasmine to take some time, understand the, the, the charts and not just for where the price is, but the whole story of it. Like what's the story of the chart? Why did it originally drop? Why does it pump, you know, and, and all of that for, for those of us who have been around a while, it's, it's like a long book with many chapters and it gets easier to, um, you know, to follow along with the story line and the storyline is also the price. It's, it's, that's what I've always had a hard time with crypto. It's so volatile that you can't ignore the price. (laughs) Very true. Yeah. (laughs) As much as you want to just shut that off, you can't even go on Twitter. There's not a hashtag that's separate for price. That's separate from the story. I mean, you could technically say the money Jasmine is different than the hashtag Jasmine. And, you know, if everybody rolled that way, I guess you could do a search for either or and probably get more information based on what you're looking for, whether it's price discovery or, you know, company news discovery, you know. Absolutely. You know, uh, lately, uh, the past like couple of months, I don't even like open my i don't know, open coinbase or my wallets or anything i can just tell if it's a green or red day just by opening up this platform not not, not, not even, i'm not even talking about chart posts i'm just saying if i don't immediately see someone you know <laughs> saying hell yeah pump you know <laughs> i'm like oh, okay it's probably flat or a red day today <laughs> well I, I had a whole period where i never looked at the charts never looked at my uh coinbase account unless i was adding you know twenty dollars or something to it and so I would sometimes post something really amazing about Jasmine thinking like, yo, this is the most amazing post ever. And it was tone deaf because almost everyone else was just watching the price. And I'm posting this great news while Jasmine is literally having a, you know, 7% tank in a five minute candle. <laughs> it, it hurts. And then I would, it hurts, you know? <laughs> well, then I would go look at the price like 30 minutes later and be like, oh my God, I, you know. I mean, I'll post no matter good day or bad day. If I find some news about Jasmine, I'll post it. But it was always like sometimes like, hmm, maybe I should like, maybe I should consider people's, you know, emotions on the bad days, I guess. I don't know. I didn't really consider anyone else's emotions because I didn't really have an angle for promoting Jasmine other than I was posting stuff that hadn't been posted before, you know, or or coming with insights that hadn't been posted before. But I don't. I probably like you. I don't really have an angle on Jasmine. I, I like it for myself. You know, I'm willing I have to one angle. It. That's to hold it. <laughs> yeah, to hold it. And, I, and you know, I, I love it for myself. And I'm willing to share everything I know about it with anyone else so that they can make uh, some kind of, you know, at least so they can learn about it because it's fascinating technology. But if, if they want to invest in it, that's, you know, that's up to them based on whatever amount of research they've done. Hopefully, you know, they've done some. Absolutely. Hey, quick disclaimer. Hey, not financial advice. Do your own research. Yeah, I have no financial advice for anyone. Uh, Penny saved is a penny earned. So Jasmine (laughs) saved is a Jasmine earned. (laughs) (laughs) One Jasmine equals one Jasmine, right? Yeah, I'm I'm old school. That was what they told us when we were kids. Penny saved is a penny earned. (laughs) (laughs) So um, which Jasmine partnership is your favorite out of all of them? Woo. Oh, I know. Tough. Yeah, there, there's a lot. No, and I, 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 I struggle with that because it, it sometimes changes. I mean, just what we we're, you know, what I shared with you today and you share with me today about Transcosmos just puts Transcosmos as boring as they are. I mean, they're a call center company. And they're just not exciting at all. <laughs> they, they're actually pretty exciting for a call center company. And, and I think what we shared that what I shared with you today was that they had um, partnered with Fortnite uh, creators to, to build in their metaverse and Transcosmos metaverse. I think even overlooked by me a lot of times, you know, it's like, it doesn't always have anything to do with Jasmine. So it can look, you know, I can overlook it sometimes, but I think Transcosmos is one of the main keys to Jasmine's success. Because Transcosmos force will end up forcing companies to deal with Jasmine in some way or the other through their call center. And Transcosmos' partner list is everyone. It's you know, it's McDonald's and it's 
Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> you know, it's it's Toyota and it's Honda. It's it's even the competitors. You know, competitors both use Transcosmos. So, I don't know if that's the most exciting partnership. I think Aplix is extremely exciting too, and it's another boring company. But I think the the Microsoft Azure connection with with Aplix, it almost feels like Aplix is some kind of an interface between Jasmine and Microsoft. And so that's very interesting. And then the Panasonic. I mean, I think maybe the Panasonic's my favorite. I'll just end it there. Hey, that's hey, that's good. I like that answer. All right. Uh, what do you <laughs> think Jasmine could improve on? Marketing and communication. Oh, yeah. Just straight up. I mean, I don't yeah, know. That was a pretty easy one. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. It's also just like... Why is it so hard? You know? I just, yeah, I know it's so hard to justify it. I always go back to the, you know, the Steve Jobs video and I'm like, you know, Apple, you know, product before marketing, the product isn't done yet. So that's like, that's, that's my only defense though. It's not a really strong defense. I mean, it's like, a, I mean, that video is like what, 20 years old or something. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, especially like after the, the long prolonged dilution, which you know, I never fully, like, I I actually fully understood the dilution. I understood why it was necessary because of J Japanese regulations stating that, you know, a domestic crypto company would have to dilute at least 70% of their tokens on international exchanges before being uh, greenlisted in Japan to be on an exchange. I remember reading that in a long, long, extensive I think it was Nishimura Law Office um, uh, article on, you know, the Japanese crypto regulations. What I didn't expect was how rapid and fast that dilution was going to be. I think that threw me for a tailwind. I just never even expected that from a company I thought would was like old Japanese respectable businessmen. You know, I just didn't I, I didn't know that financial strategy i still don't fully understand it but you know i've learned to kind of roll with it yeah and if uh, if you weren't here for that you know you can look up uh, bellwood enterprises and uh suzuki that was the last yep. name of that guy so yeah that was pretty much why that happened that, that came from them right they made it really deliberate fast and, and and sudden and just caught everyone off guard it caught me off guard for sure and and I think at some point we had all suspected that there was some mishandling of the token, um, you know, circulating supply. And that started before we knew about Bellwood. That started with Coinbase manipulating the percentage numbers. Like Jasmine would be up 60%, but it wouldn't be on the top mover list. It could be down 60%. And then all of a sudden it was on the top mover list. It was like everything was, it was, it was like everybody was trying to make sure Jasmine could just flop. And it seemed suspicious to me at the time, too. It almost made me want to buy more. You know, like, I think at times I did buy more. I was like, nah, I don't believe this. Like, I would go back and forth from being outright horrified to going back to my conviction, reading, you know, my Jasmine notes again and being like, I'm calling bullshit on this. This is complete BS. And I, yeah, I still that, that was that was tough because everything that we were researching and, and looking at and the community was doing was saying one thing and the price action was just saying the complete opposite. And it was it was, you know, and we were on the defensive for like two years. Yeah. And I think there was a certain point where we were able to chalk some of it up to just miss, you know, uh, lost in translation and, and things like that. But I. I also there's points where I was like, this is just so unacceptable. And it wasn't even the dilution at that point, it was also the communication. It was the communication of Jasmine's team to us saying, hey, something bad happened. We're going to correct it. I think everybody would have been cool with it, but I think people might have um, done better with their DCA. And I think for the people that were in at that time, any Jasmine they bought that they held to this date makes the floor stronger for Jasmine. It doesn't make it weaker. You want the most fervent people to get in on the ground floor. That's why most tokens start at zero and go up. Jasmine started up and went to, you know, basically to zero. <laughs> so it was a very opposite 
to most of the tokens that I had been used to looking at, like Bitcoin, you know, starts off small and then it grows based on demand, where Jasmine was like falling even as demand was going up. So it was it was just hard for me to reconcile that at the time. But because of my research, my conviction was, you know, pretty rock solid and resolute. And I even got to the point where I was like, you know, it either goes to zero or just or I, or it works. This is going to work or it goes to zero. Absolutely. And, cool. and hey, a shout out to all of you that have that are still here. You know, I mean, all of you are badass in my eye. Now, uh, since we're discussing price and so with this answer, you can kind of give me like, where do you think about a price range and what do you think about development? Like, where do you think Jasmine will be in 2026 and 2030 when Lambo? Well, I'm going to have to just bring a little of that last question into this question because um Every company that I've ever seen that was worth a damn has a chart similar to Jasmine. It has a story similar to Jasmine. And when I looked at Sony's chart over a 20-year period and looked at Jasmine's new, you know, three-year chart, what I saw in Sony's chart was actually exactly what I saw in Jasmine's chart. It started at a price, it skyrocketed, it dipped for like several, you know, 10 years, 15 years. <laughs> and then it literally reached a new all time high eventually looking very much like that U shape that's developing with Jasmine, you know, where we can go back up. I think Jasmine has to execute, um, obviously for their story to continue attracting investors. But I, I did watch Apple go from a garage in, you know, uh, California to uh, one of the probably the most global company in the world. I mean, I don't, there's not many rivals to Apple, and they started in a garage, and they they just had some really smart people. And Jasmine is basically ahead of that. They have, you know, a team that this is not their first time going into business on something. It's not going to be their first success. It, won't be their first failure, but I think they've had enough successes and failures uh, throughout their career to know how to uh, make this successful. I don't think they would even try at this age. I just don't even see wh what 80 year old wants to still be working unless they're just absolutely passionate and believe in something or somebody tasked them to do it. You know, It's really handy to have that kind of like life experience. And I've noticed that the Jasmine community may be a little bit older on average than some other crypto communities. Most people I talk to are at least 30. So I just, I just think that's interesting. I think we're a more mature community. I think, yeah, I think we're based, maybe uh, Jasmine allows us to be a little bit based more in reality because there's a lot of reality to Jasmine, not only in the purpose of Jasmine, but like that they have patents they have partners <laughs> like, yeah i mean you know? the internet of things is like like taking crypto and bringing it to reality i mean the biggest red flag on a crypto for me not the biggest but one of one of the red flags for me on a crypto is i look at their partner page they got 250 partners i've never heard of one of them not a single one they all got names like zydex chain and things i've never heard of and just you know too many z's too many x's and weird names i'm just like i don't know any of this and so maybe it's because i'm old and i'm i'm like gary gensler or something because of my age but, <laughs> but but i like seeing panasonic and hitachi and fujitsu and you know toyota and companies i've heard of because uh they've been here my whole life. Toyota was here before I was born and they'll probably be here after. And so was, has, was Panasonic. And some of these companies Jasmine is partnered with are hundred year old companies. They're not even, you know, we think of them as eighties companies because that's when we started seeing them in, in the U S as you know, the Japanese technological invasion came in. But a lot of these companies go way, way back, um, including NTT, which actually started off as a very old American company. And eventually became a Japanese company, Nippon Telegraph um, Company. It, it is crazy. I love seeing Jasmine partner with insanely old companies, if not directly, indirectly. And yeah, like the, uh, I forget the, it's like the the architects and the, and the engineers uh, that, that in Japan is one of, it's like about a hundred year company for infrastructure and they, they're working with them now. So, it, right. I, I, and I, Panasonic was uh, Matsushita. 
before it was Panasonic. And they, at some point, they owned Sanyo too. They still own Sanyo, but at some point, they had bought Sanyo and a bunch of other companies that we used to hear about that we don't hear about so much anymore because they killed off a lot of their brands, absorbed the technology into their other brands that they were already selling. But most of these companies are still around. Sanyo is still around, and they're, they develop a whole bunch of stuff for Panasonic. And they do air conditioning, vents, and they, all of it's IoT. You know, all of it's controllable through IoT devices. So, you know, even, even the companies that seem kind of far off are still within Jasmine's scope of uh, infrastructure for IoT. And then seeing that announcement with Panasonic, because we'd seen that Panasonic had something to do with Jasby. It didn't always look legit. We didn't have enough info on it. But with the recent announcement, it was very, very, um, it's, a, it's a great look because they actually announced what we were saying in the announcement. It wasn't just that Jasby's working with Panasonic, it was Jasby's working with Panasonic to build out a platform, an IoT platform for the world. 